Robin speaking. Well, I know for a fact we have reached the right place. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening, actor, author, superhero, and canine and cat crusader, the one and only Mr. Burt Ward. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome. Hello, citizens. Bert, I want you to know that you were on the show four years ago. And <laughs> I've been know. doing this show for 25 years, actually on the air for 45. Started out at a little AM FM station back in Illinois. Uh, last year, I had some misfortune and got cancer and was in a coma and was out for over a year. I oh chose you to be my first interview back because now I'm better and I'm in the studio. I needed my hero of my lifetime. I'm so sorry to hear that. Yeah, thank you. He's. It's been a long road. Was, his last interview was April 2nd of last year. So this tonight wow. is his first interview in over a year. And it's been a year of chemo and physical therapy and rehabilitation. But he's back in the studio. And, and he's very honored to have you join him the first night back. Oh, well, I am very honored to be on your show. And gosh, I I, I wish you all the very best. And, uh, and, uh, and I'm sure things are going to certainly skyrocket to the top now that you're back in, you know, in fighting shape. Right. Well, you, you know, so many things have happened since we've last talked to you. I was so thrilled to hear uh, you uh, and your cohort, Adam West, uh, the greatest heroes of all time. Uh, a great audio clip that's played at the end of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. How do you feel about that? Oh, that was a, that was a great honor. You know, and uh, there they I, apparently they've used the clip of, of my show of me in it in the uh, the Flash movie that oh. came out. Oh, oh wow! Uh, yeah, that uh, I I don't know. And then of course I did a um, well, I got my star on Hollywood Boulevard, which was a great honor. I was really thrilled uh, on, on that, and uh, and that was uh, January 9th, uh, uh, twenty twenty. And then right after that, um, I was on Supergirl. I made a, a, a guest appearance on Supergirl that they, uh, and it was right before the opening titles. They used me right before the opening titles, and uh, it got a lot of a lot of response from all across the country. So it just, you know, I I, I don't know exactly what it is, but there's a lot of retro, uh, you know, emotion and things like that, and uh, and it's great. I love right. it. Well, you know. As we were announcing that you were going to be on the show tonight and getting ready for the show, we had a lot of questions and stuff that were submitted by listeners, and I'll be fielding them in during the interview tonight. But one of the questions that came up a lot was in talking about uh, your appearance on Supergirl and, and the whole multiverse, that they the thing that they did. Some listeners were wanting to know, because it, the, the cameo was you as some of your beautiful Great Danes, but they wanted to know, were you supposed to be just a citizen, or were you supposed to be Dick Grayson? They, they, there was a little bit lost because it was it was quick, so everybody's wanting to know, yeah. like, was which which character were you supposed to be? Oh, well, I was Dick Grayson, definitely. But here's what's really interesting. You know, my wife and I operate the world's largest giant breed dog rescue, mm -hmm. so when I went up there to be on the show, I didn't know that they would have me walking a dog, right? <laughs> and, I, and I'm saying, I, you know, and it, it's kind of funny because, you know, we all live in our own worlds and sometimes, you know, we get so occupied. But so I'm saying to myself, well, maybe maybe they're doing this because, you know, I live with 50 dogs in my house. Right. You know, maybe that, but then I said, but gee, they do know that I have giant breed dogs. I don't have German Shepherds. Right. And the more I thought about it, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's go back, and I remember, uh, I wasn't there at the time, but I certainly read the original comic book, that there was a German Shepherd dog, okay? And, and that, was, that was the dog that was in the comic book, okay? Mm. <laughs> wow. I mean, that was, that, was, that was their dog, you know what I mean? Uh, and uh, so... You know, anyway, it was it, a piece of trivia that whoever put the segment together had put two and two together and had me walking. You know what I mean? The Bat Dog, Ace the Bat Dog, Ace the, the Bat Dog, in yes. the original comic book. It, it's too know? bad they wouldn't let you have your uh, 
website URL on the back of your shirt. Because <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would have loved that. Well, you know, I came up with it. You looked at the colors in in the. It, it was kind of a kind of like almost a, a pro on a sweater. But if you if you look at the colors, they were, oh, those are all the colors of my original costume. Yeah. And and you know, I mean, the red for the red vest, the yellow for the cape, the black for the mask, the green for the trunks and the boots. I mean, and the gloves. I mean, it was uh, it was a tribute, you know, to the colors that I wore when I wore the costume. Well, let me ask you how you feel about uh, yes, Supergirl, but also some of the other recent incantations. I know that there is a, a big feeling of nostalgia, and of course everybody loves Batman 66. But how do you feel about some of the newer uh, superhero vehicles that are out there? We talked to Julie Newmar, and she told us that she wasn't a big fan of, like, for example, some of the newer superhero movies. She said it was too fast, too loud, and too violent. So how do you feel about some of the newer superhero vehicles, not only film, but also on TV with things like Gotham Knights? Yeah, well, you know, I'll tell you, Warner Brothers has done a, an amazing job. They know their market. And, you know, I, I must tell you, you know, our show was for television. Our show was for families. Our show came on at, you know, 7.30 uh, twice a week, prime time. And our show was targeted all across America and actually the world for that people would have their, you know, like the family, the kids are in school and husband and wife might both be at work or maybe one's home and the other's at work but then in the evening when everybody got together and had their dinner and then after dinner the family as a family got together to watch television batman that was our target market right and our target market was pure loving family you know there was violence on batman but it wasn't real violence you know like uh some villain would pick up a chair and hit Batman over the head with it. He'd fall down, but in two seconds later, he's up. And, you know, there was never any blood, never any real violence. You, you know what I mean? Right. And as a result of that, we fit in as a family show. Now, you've got to understand, when when they started making the Batman movies for, for theatrical release, they looked at who is their target market. Who are the ones that are buying the tickets to go to theaters? What are they expecting to see? What are the standards? What are the you know minimum expectations in order to fulfill the price of a ticket? And they made those decisions, okay, which were different than the decisions made for television. But I'll tell you a couple of things you might find interesting. One is, if you really think about it, if Batman had not been the success that it was, you might none of us might be seeing all these superhero movies that have come out over the years. Exactly right? right. I mean, Batman proved it. That's number one. Number two, from a, if you want to really like look into the trivia of things, on Batman, Adam and I created something that is, was not only used on Batman, but is used in almost every movie, action movie that comes out. No matter even, it doesn't even have to be a superhero movie. It could be a movie like Bad Boys or something. And that thing that we created was where in the middle of what would appear to be a serious moment that we we say something that has a comic flair to it. Right. Okay? So, like, as an example, we were in the museum uh, in, in, in one of the episodes. We're looking for the Joker, and all of a sudden, these eight giant guys drop out from, or come out from the shadows, some come out from the floor above, whatever it was. All of a sudden, we're faced, and, and we're going to have to fight. There's no question about that. You know? And I had a line... You know what I mean? Right at this tense moment, I turned to Batman. I said, gosh, Batman, there's eight of them against two of us. Odds in our favor. <laughs> right? Because there was only eight of them against two of us. <laughs> so now, I mean, now look fa fast forward to the movies of today. I mean, look at, I mean, movies, whether it be DC or even Marvel, four with the, mm -hmm. the fight scenes where, you know what I mean, they're having, an, and they have this dialogue, or, or the movie's bad boys, where one of them will say to the other, if we, right, they're, they're dodging bullets, and they'll say something like, if we got out of this alive, I'm never coming to your house. I mean, right. things <laughs> that are funny, and that right in the middle of the serious moment, and people love it. Absolutely. And it's just about it. And this is something that Adam and I took great pride in having brought to the screen. It had never been done before. When we came on with Batman, 
if you watched programming in 1966, you saw medical shows where somebody was really sick and the doctor was trying to save their life. You saw, you know, what I would call, I guess, uh, police shows where somebody was being hunted for a crime and, you know, and they're, they're trying to, and everything was very straight line. Yes. In other words, there's the good guys, there's the bad guys, and the person who was the viewer was like the third person, so to speak. You're watching an event between two opposing forces, the good guys and the bad guys type of thing, right? Or the or the doctors and the illness. You're, you're watching, but, but you're not part of it. What right. we did on Batman is we made an effort, Adam and I, to try to reach through that television screen and grab those viewers and bring them into Batman. Yeah. And that's why you would have kids running around with bath towels around their neck <laughs> held together with clothespins jumping off their couches. We had women, grown women with Batman hairdos. <laughs> I mean, you, 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 you know, because we had that very broad appeal and we tried to incorporate, we tried to bring our audience into our world. And it was that comedy and that sense of timing that really, really did make you and Adam the best choices for the roles. Because I'll tell you, Bert, we were watching some of the screen tests of Lyle Wagner and and Peter Dial, and right. there is no comparison compared to them and you. Uh, Lyle, well, great, great Lyle, actor, Lyle was good in Wonder Woman, but he, he was, was good. very, very, very straight. But he's not Adam West, and it would have right. really not been as good with right. him as well, it was. Let, let me tell you about that. Let me tell you a little trivia about that. Mm -hmm. When I went in for my screen test, I had no idea what I was trying out for. And in fact, until at, until six weeks after I got the role, I had no idea what I had tried out for, and I had no <laughs> idea that I'd gotten it. And I'd actually technically gotten it six weeks before, okay? <laughs> because the studio didn't tell me I had it, and the agents that I had didn't tell me I had it. And I was getting phone calls from Fox every week like, oh, what's your shoe size? <laughs> oh, well, uh, and a half. what's your hat size? <laughs> well, I don't, I don't wear a hat. Well, go get your head measured. Well, where do I go to get my head measured? You know, I mean, I'm just an innocent kid, right? And I didn't, I, I did, I had no idea. And I'm wondering why are they calling me and asking me these questions? You know. Anyway, but uh, 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 our show that when I first at the screen test met Adam, it, what it, and it's very unusual that the two of us screen tested together. But I went in and I I, I studied martial arts. Uh, I was a brown belt in karate. And, and uh, I did some stuff. I broke a board with my hand, part of my screen test. And then I was set to do the dialogue with Adam. Now, you have to understand, I was given a single sheet of paper. On that sheet of paper, there were paragraphs with a single person's name at the top of each paragraph. Like, I was told, you're going to read Dick. There was no Dick Grayson. Mm -hmm. There was no Bruce Wayne. It was only paragraphs with Dick and then Bruce and then Dick and then Bruce. That's it. Hmm. Nothing on... Batman, not, nothing, nothing but Bruce and Dick. So, you know, those could have been anybody. Right. So they, they said, you'd like to meet the person you're going to read with. And I said, sure. So they introduced me to Adam, and uh, there was an open seat next to him. So I sat down. I said, would you like to run some lines? He said, sure. Within two or three minutes, the two of us were laughing. We got along so well, and we never stopped laughing for over 50 years. <laughs> never stopped laughing. He had this most amazing sense of humor that I totally understood and connected with, okay? And, and the, it made it so easy because, you know, if you think about it, what makes things really people attracted to it? Things that appear really sincere and real and not, not scripted. And Adam and I had this chemistry, honestly, a chemistry that that, that you put the two of us together, we wouldn't even have to say anything. You put the two of us together and people start laughing. Okay? <laughs> and I don't even know why they were laughing, but they did. And and so what happened with Adam, you know, he loved, he, he thought of himself like, uh, well, he, you know, he thought of himself like Winston Churchill. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I loved him so much. But, you know, he really saw himself. In fact, he said to me one time, you know, Bert, he said, there's the three Bs. I said, oh, well, what are the three Bs? Well, he said, Bond, Beatles, and Batman. That's right. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's right. Okay, you you that's know, I've, I've got to ask you, Bert, because we met Adam, 
and he was so kind and so funny and he made a lot of jokes referencing himself as William Shatner. What's that all about? Did he like love William Shatner or Oh no no they 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 were in com- competitive with each other. Ah. You know, very competitive and and in fact they actually co-starred in a movie together. Uh, I don't recall the movie. It was it was one of those things where they were playing like Roman gladiators or something like that. I don't remember exactly, but they were but they were very competitive with each other. Now I worked with William Shatner. Adam and I both did in the last uh, animated movie that I provided the voice of Robin. Adam provided you know the voice of Batman, and mm-hmm. and William Shatner you know provided the, the voice of of the of the evil villain. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and uh, the, and so we all worked together, which was really unusual. I mean, you think about it. Wow, here you got the two most iconic TV shows in history, Batman right. yeah. and Star Trek, with the actors working together. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, that was uh, a, a real tribute too, because Hollywood had decided it wanted to be faster and louder, and they started with Michael Keaton right. and they had Val Kilmer and went on. But they obviously thought that there was still value in you and Adam, and they brought you back for those two animated features right at the end of Adam's life and because they knew people wanted you back and you did come back and it was awesome. Oh yeah and and you know uh, an, another thing is that I also um, uh, Warner Brothers uh, put out through their uh, uh, consumer division a, 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 a famous coffee table book 80 years of the boy wonder you know what I mean Where mm-hmm. it's good, not that I was 80 but the character was 80 years old that had been created 80 years ago and you know it was really an honor I, they, I was asked to write the introduction which i did and it's in the it's in the book it's a me- it's every single comic with robin in it cool <laughs> i mean there must be four or five hundred pages it's just amazing and it just was beautiful color and i mean just an amazing book and i was really honored to do that and also when they started their streaming service they asked me to come in and they said oh we'd just like you to you know uh, read this uh, on camera for us. And I said, oh, okay, no big deal. I'll go in and for a couple hours. Well, let me tell you something. Boy, did they get their money's worth. <laughs> I was looking. They, they, each one of these shows, I read four pages. I'm sure I used the teleprompter, but I mean, I'm talking about four single space pages. It was like 10 or 15 minutes just wow. to read the introduction with each character and where they came from and how they related and what the scenes were and what the background and how it evolved and oh my gosh it went on and on and all of their shows that were going to be on the streaming service it's I, i'm telling you it was a morning to night kind of deal wow. right i didn't think i was going to talk for a week after that and then before oh. we we got the the last movies with with you and adam you and adam brought batman back in the 70s because filmation was working with a batman show and previously casey Kasem did Robin, but right. then they brought you right. and Adam in for the new adventures of Batman. Right, with his character Batmite. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and it was so funny because, you know, uh, the owners of Filmation, one of them was Norman Prescott. He yeah. was the, the president of Filmation. Legend. And, uh, yeah, and, and the other was Lou Scheimer, the, the two owners of them. Really nice guys. Amazingly nice guys. But I'll tell you a little funny uh, story that, uh, kind of a you know trivia thing that one time uh, norman prescott came to me and he said you know he said your partner is quite a character i said oh believe me i know he said, <laughs> he said, he said you know adam is the only person he had met in his entire life that everything he said had a sexual connotation oh my <laughs> oh my. this adam could he could say things that would embarrass people i'm telling you you just want to just your skin would crawl like, like he would, but so funny and the way he did it he and you and you see our campy style you never really knew oh is they really mean it or is he just saying that? Right. You know, it was this very campy style that we had on batman which is when i wrote my book boy wonder my life in tights i used that same campy style you know mm-hmm. uh you know to tell my story so it's the kind of thing that uh, anyway it, it, and adam and i just we just had this chemistry so and, and uh, by the way, you know, the great comic duos in history have had contrast, okay? I mean, you think about it, Laurel and Hardy, right? Yes. You know, one heavy and one skinny. Uh, you got uh, Abbott and Costello. Uh, you got 
Johnny Carson, Ed McMahon, you know what I mean? Great contrast, right? And and so the way Adam and I worked, I I kind of responded the more dignified and slow talking and you know, thinking of himself in a you know, in a this enormously gigantic way. <laughs> the faster I talked and the quicker I did it and, and it and in other words, I just went counterpoint to everything he did. And and you know, we you I don't know, there's a chemistry. I don't even know how to describe it. People sensed it. Yeah. And it just clicked. It just there was just no they never thought of us as an actors. I mean they I mean that's Batman and Robin. Well yeah. I think I think the chemistry of you two being such close and long term friends really showed and, and it does show. Like we've even studied you know, different comedy troops and stuff. You can tell when they love each other. You can tell when they film something on yeah. the on the eve of them fighting because it translates. And that love you and Adam had for each other really shone through. I love that that Adam got things in because it was tongue in cheek. Did he not run a scene to like fifteen takes? You were laying there with Yvonne Craig, and she was passed out from bat gas because she couldn't know right. where the bat cave was. And he had said something that had kind of a sexual connotation. I'll tell you exactly. I'll t- I remember it in- perfectly. We were we, what it was for whatever reason. It's the third season. We had brought that girl to the bat cave. Of course, we couldn't let her know the true identity, so she had to have a whiff of bat gas that knocked her out before we brought her in. And then after we showed it to her, we had to you know give her a whiff of bat gas. And we were taking her out, and we're riding. We're sitting in the Batmobile. I'm sitting in my passenger side. You know, Adam is Batman is sitting in the driver's, and she's like in the middle, okay? And and, and she's already asleep from, from the bat, you know, yeah. So anyway, I uh, I have this line to Adam, simple line. This was supposed to be like two quick lines, right? Really quick. And I have a line like, gosh, Batman, you know, Batgirl is really very pretty. And and, and Batman has a line, something to the effect is, uh, I'm glad you noticed Robin shows you're growing up, or something like that. Throwaway line. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Adam missed 11 straight takes. You got to understand, uh, when, to, in order to, for, to, every time you roll film, because this is not video, this is film, you have to, you have to bring the, the, the speed of the film in the camera up to speed, the, re- the, the, the audio recording has to be perfect and tested, everything has to be right, the lighting, the, I have, you just wouldn't believe what it takes to, to shoot every one. He messed up 11 takes. And, 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 okay, and the director, and, and I'm wondering, I'm saying, Adam, I mean, come on. You know, that's not the, you know, that's a piece of cake. What's going on? So I don't know, Bert, I don't know. <laughs> well, let me tell you, he knew exactly what he was doing. <laughs> so so on, the, on the 12th take, when he knew, he, as, as I call it, stretching the elastic as far as you dare go, he had got it where they were going to have to use it no matter what, right, in this next take. So here we have the scene, and camera, action, and I say, Gosh, Batman, you know, that girl is very pretty. And he says, his line is, uh, I'm glad you noticed that, Robin. It shows the oncoming thrust of manhood. Oh, my God. <laughs> now, when they said I, cut, I, tears, I, I tears can... Tears were coming out of my eyes. Yeah. Listen, no, no, I, nobody I, noticed it. Let me tell you something. They didn't notice it. They were really? so panicky. Cut print. You know, they just took it. Because he didn't stop. He got through it. They just said, we're, we're taking it, whatever it is. So everything was kind of quiet until it was edited, aired on television, and about a week or two later, we get called into the office, oh, and there's my. the censor. <laughs> they, you can't say that on television. <laughs> what? what? Oh, I accidentally messed up my line. I, I was struggling to try to get that line right. You know what I mean? Oh, and he played innocent, right? Uh, and that was the beginning of many times that we were visited by the center <laughs> on Batman. You can't do that. You can't imply that. You you know, oh my gosh. I mean and, and it was all done without ever saying a bad word. Right. It was right. always some you know, you can use your voice to to imply things. You know what I mean? Which he was a genius. Oh, at. he was like Shatner in that fact. Yes. Yeah, they were oh, both yeah. well, that way. But Shatner's got a very sense funny sense of humor a really nice guy i loved work with i made a, an appearance with him in new york at the new york comic con with the release of that last movie okay and uh and and okay and 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 he's very funny very nice guy really funny guy very razor sharp intellect okay 
But he was a little different than Adam. His was based on just really funny way of seeing things. Adam was not just funny. It always had some really weird sexual thing to it. You know what I mean? <laughs> now, I got to know. I mean, let, let me just tell you. Let me just tell you one here, okay? okay. Now, this, again, you're using perfectly normal speech, right? I'm going to tell you. Perfectly normal speech. Adam and I were, were forced to go to this uh, whatever cocktail party for something with some executives for some station, whatever it was. I don't even remember what it was. But we're there, and we had to be there, and we had these uh, two ladies uh, that were, we were talking to, and they were something from the station. I think both of them had maybe a little bit too much to drink. And Adam and I, you know, we, we never dr drank or anything. And I, well, I never drank my whole life, but he would never drink at any kind of an appearance or anything. So one lady is with saying hello to us, and then she turns to her friend, and she says, oh, let's get something to eat. I'm hungry. And Adam leans over and looks her right in the eyes and says, are you hungry? Oh, my oh, God. Wow. <laughs> oh, I, I just, oh, oh, my Lord. So I, I know you thought it was funny, but the, the ladies of the show, Julie Newmar, yeah. uh, Eartha Kitt, uh, Lee Merriweather, uh, uh, you know, the great fat girl, Yvonne Craig. What did they think of Adam's sense of humor? What did Yvonne think when uh, that came out about the thrust of man? Oh, well, uh, y Yvonne understood Adam. She, you know, let me tell you something. Everyone understood Adam. <laughs> the, the, Adam was actually fearless, and, except for one person he was afraid of. You know who he was afraid of? Who? Julie Newmar. Really? <laughs> because Julie Newmar could come out with something even wilder than Adam said. <laughs> Bert, I had Julie Newmar on the show. I was afraid of her, too. <laughs> Yes. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! There's a couple of times we made appearances together. We came out on the stage and we're talking to the audience, and she would say something that, oh, I'm telling you, I was just like I didn't even know what to do. I was just melting on the floor. I was just so embarrassed, you know. But 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 she. Oh, and she is amazing, and she is very smart. Yeah. Let me tell you something. That lady, and very perceptive, incredibly perceptive. She, you know, and, and, and the two of them, and it was a great line on Batman where she, I don't know if you're, you guys remember seeing this, but she was talking to Batman. She says, you know, Batman, we could have such a wonderful time together. We could join forces. You know, we could marry and, and live a fantastic life together. And Batman says, well, what do we do about Robin? She says, oh, just kill him. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know? <laughs> I mean, it, it, yeah, it, we had such a wonderful time on this show. The, everybody loved it. The crew loved it. You know, there was a scene as, with, with the villain's hideouts, and I could never understand. Why did they always, you know, a film at an angle? I didn't understand that. Mm -hmm. And and it was after the show, and I ran into one of the cinematographers, and, you know, I never understood. Everything in that show was great. Everything was correct, level. But for some reason, you always had some kind of a weird angle when you shot the villain's hideout. He said, oh yeah, we did that on purpose. I said, well, why would you do that on purpose? He says, because they were crooked. Mm. So they made the angle of the camera crooked. There, there was a lot of inside I jokes. Never knew that. I never knew that, and I was on the show for 120 right. episodes. <laughs> there was a lot of inside jokes, and there was a lot of goofing around, from what I understand. Now, you knew Bruce Lee, because you lived in the complex he lived in right. before Batman. And you sparred right. with him when you trained together. That's and this right. And that. We were friends. We used to go to dinner together. Yeah. And then he wound up being on the show, and you had Bruce's first fight with Cato right. and, and Robin. Bruce, Bruce Lee's first film fight scene of his entire career was fighting me on Batman. And the reason he was on Batman, we had the same executive producer, William Dozier. Ah. And, and, and he, what, he had been cast as Cato in a new series that was going to come out, The Green Hornet, that was to come out the next uh, you know, fall on ABC, same network. And what better way to promote that series coming out than to have them appear on the number one show, and number one and number two, because we were on twice a week, right. in the entire world, which was Batman. Now, I understand, that, even that's though... That's they did that. Sure, I understand, even though you were used to fighting with Bruce in training... Did Bruce play a joke on you in your scene where he was supposed to fight you? He kind of came at you and kind of surprised you, and you jumped back. Is that no, right? No, 
that's a bunch of hokey. Oh, okay. Let me tell you something. <laughs> what, what we did in sparring was a lot rougher, a really rough, that they would never allow that on television, okay, because it was real. This had to be, everything was simulated, and everything was bigger than life, and it's the, you know, there's a scene where, like, uh, he kicks me and I roll over a desk and then I, you know, I hit him. I mean, no, it was, and, and another thing, it was, we're very, they were very strict about this. Everything had to be exactly equal, nobody, because both, they, you see, Batman and Robin didn't know that the Green Hornet and Kato were good guys. Yeah. Right. We thought they were bad guys. And the Green Hornet and Kato thought Batman and Robin were bad guys. Okay, even though we were the good guys. So they, they didn't want anything to look like one side got an upper hand, and they certainly didn't want it to look like there was real violence. They wanted the same campy style that we had on Batman that worked so well that you could accept as family entertainment. Right. Well, you know, once upon a time, I want to know what you thought, if you thought it was a real dramatization of the way things really were back then. And the other question is I guess Bruce Lee's daughter was very unhappy with the way they portrayed her father as being arrogant. Is that true or not? How was Bruce Lee, and was the movie a real representation of the times? Which, which movie you're talking about? Once the upon one, a time. The one that, once upon a time in Hollywood. Oh yeah, right, 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 right. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, Bruce would never have lost that fight. <laughs> 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 It, it, it wouldn't have lasted 10 seconds. Brad Pitt would have gotten kicked in the head and he'd be out cold. Right. No, 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 no. No, no. Uh, uh, the, uh, that, was, that was, and I think it was a, uh, I think it was a, a joke done. Not an, it, I don't think it was meant to put Bruce Lee down because there's no way, you know, it, it, okay, no way he would have lost. No way he would have even been touched. Right. Uh, but 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 the, the, it was a satire, you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and and, uh, and and I do understand. Uh, I, you know, I I never met his daughter. Mm -hmm. I, I I I remember the last time he and I went to dinner with Linda, his wife, and Brandon, his son, who was six months old at the time. Mm -hmm. This is long before his daughter was born. Right. And uh, we went down to Chinatown and. He had lived in Hong Kong for 10 years, so he knew all the most authentic things. That, there were, they weren't even on the menu that we ordered. We had a, a great time. But, but no, I, 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 I can understand why his family would, would not like that. I can understand that. But at the same time, I, I can also understand that it was a spoof. It wasn't really meant that he would have lost in a real fight because he never would have. He would never have. N not in, not in the um, one in a 10 billion chances. So was it true know. that that Bruce Lee demanded that the fight between... Uh, the two teams, Batman and Robin and Kato and Green Hornet, come to a draw. He didn't want you guys to win. No, no, no. The studio didn't want wanted it to be equal. Oh, okay. It was written to be equal. No, Bruce was he look he was thrilled to be an actor. He's here's on television. This is like the first television series of his career. You know what I mean? Yes. Right. Uh, and, and no, he was and and he's a nice guy and we're we're friends. You understand? We're friends. You yeah. know what I mean? It's the not the. It, it, it was nothing like, you know, there's an old saying in Los Angeles, I mean, in show business. When you sneeze in Los Angeles, they say, God bless you in New York. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like a fish story that starts as a, as a minnow, and by the time it gets to the other end of the country, it's a whale. Right. It's just not true and not by any stretch. Bruce was a really fun guy, a funny guy, a happy, a very happy person. Yeah. He was like, he was a jokester. He had a sense of humor. You know, uh, we, that's why we got along. And it was so funny because all of the people that seemed to be around Batman were had great senses of humor right. th around the show. You know, and they they all had that stuff. Even the actors, the superstars that came on our show, they loved it. They loved it more than acting in other movies. And they would tell me, well, the reason I love it so much is that I can be as big and broad as I want to be. And you know what I mean? I, like, like you know, Cesar Romero with his laugh, that he could make this hysterical laugh. He could never do that in a regular movie. <laughs> no. But he could right. do it with Batman. He, right. Yeah, right? He, he was I mean, a romantic in other movies. It. They, they wanted they wanted all these actors, you know what I mean? Vincent Price is egghead, okay? You know, look how many movies Vincent Price was in. Right and 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 he came on. He had the best time. Yeah. He, we had a giant egg fight at Old McDonald's <laughs> Farm. I mean, yeah, the, the, uh, it was amazing. It no. was. It, we just had a, everybody had a fantastic time. It was a. 
it was a different period in our in our country. This was the '60s. This was the period of the flower children and the free love and the you know Woodstock and the you know what I mean. I mean, right. this was a whole different world than it is today. Now, a question that we got submitted from our listeners is kind of going along the lines of of the clip, uh, the promo that was played at the end of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. That was with a contest that had to do with KHJ back in the 60s. And everybody was wondering, they wanted us to ask you, if you remember that contest and the winner and how it went. Because supposedly the winner got to come out to 20th Century Fox, have lunch with with you and Adam, and then go to the Batcave. Now, did they go to the set? Did they go to Bronson? Do you remember how that went down? That happened. That That was real. And it was funny that he put decided, you know, to, to, the director decided to put that at the end of the I think it, it, Look, he's very creative director. I mean, phenomenal director, incredibly successful. And he, his vision saw that. And it was, you know, it was all real. Everything that was there was real. Right. Do you remember the winner coming out? I mean, how did that go when you met the winner? No, that I don't remember. Okay. You have to understand. I mean, <laughs> we're, we're working. You, you, you know, if people think of the glamour of filming. You know, let me tell you what it's like. You got to get up early in the morning. You got to be there between six and seven. You, your eyes are, you're, you can hardly open your eyes. You're so tired from, from the night that, the, before, you know, finishing late by the time you get home and you're exhausted. Uh, and, and there you are, and you can't even open your eyes, and they're making you open your eyes to put makeup on your, under your eyes, makeup on your face. Then you get into the most incredibly uncomfortable costume in the entire <laughs> world, right? And, and there you are, everything itches, hurts, pinches. I mean, you just can't conceive. And then you go on the set, you know, and, and, and it's like you, you wait 45 minutes right. and then work for 30 seconds. Well, what just a- think, 30 seconds. Then you wait another 45 <laughs> minutes and wait. And then, and then, of course, the people say, oh, why didn't you just bring a book? I said, oh, I tried, but guess what happens? You sit down, you start to read your book, and here comes the assistant. Right? Oh, Bert, we got to have you make up for touch up right now. Right now, we got and, and a whole thing in show business. The most famous phrase on a on a film set is "Hurry up and wait." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then yeah, on top of that, uh, all of this for like what was it, two hundred fifty dollars a week? They paid you. You had to do your own stuff. Oh no, I made a ton of money. I was at three hundred and fifty a week oh, for the my. first year, <laughs> and then it was skyrocketed to four fifty a week for the second year. And then when I had half a season of filming on the third years, when the when the grand prize of six hundred dollars a week. Wow! Wow! For for I think that was for uh, I think it was twenty six episodes. Right. Yeah. No. I, it, it, this was this. Look, you know, I was a young person. I was given an amazing opportunity. There were eleven hundred people that tried out for the role. I got it. Mm-hmm. Which, by the way, I you know the produ- executive producer came to me when my first day. Uh, before we started filming, but I had to be there for rehearsals and stuff. And uh, he came to me and said, would you like to know, Bert, why we selected you to play Robin? Mm-hmm. I said, yes, sir, I would. And he said, well, we it took us over a year and a half. We le- uh, uh, interviewed more than 1,100 un- uh, other young actors for this role. But the reason we picked you is because forgetting acting for a minute, forget television. What if there was a real Robin? I mean, like the real thing. Right. Mm-hmm. We think if there was a real Robin, that you personally, not as an actor, you personally would be exactly what we want. Yeah. So we don't want you to act, per se. We want you to do only two things. One, be yourself, and two, be enthusiastic. There you go. That's exactly what I did for 120 episodes. What and they you didn't, still are. What they didn't tell you, Bert, is that they also wanted you to do all your own stunts, which I understand landed you in the hospital a couple of times. Couple? I was in the hospital, emergency hospital four out of the first six days of filming. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. You know, and, and I mean, the, the, how about the first shot of the first day of filming? in Bronson Canyon, coming out of the Batcave in the Batmobile. <clears throat> I get there, and there at 6 in the morning, I got all this makeup on, I got this hot, itchy costume on, and, and they say, okay, Bert, you go into the cave, there's the Batmobile there, get in the car, we're going to drive out, and you're going to come out of the cave fast, and then the sign's going to go down, you're going to drive, they make it, the, the, you know, the, you're going to be a sharp left turn, 
and 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 then the car's heading off for Gotham City, and then that's when the sign comes back up. I right. said, okay. So I go in the cave, and it's dark. I mean, you know, it, it, when you've been out in the bright light, and you go into a dark place, it takes a few minutes for your eyes to adjust. And right. I kind of had tried to find where the Batmobile, oh, there it is. Okay, I, and I get in, and, and then I, I see a costume person over there sitting next to, to me in the driver's seat. I said, Adam? He says, no, this is Hubie. I said, oh, I, well, where's Adam? Oh, uh, he's, uh, he's on the set having coffee. Mm. I said, oh having coffee he's not here no i said well why is he not here well because this is a very dangerous shot and the studio doesn't want to take a chance of him getting hurt so they've hired me i'm a stunt driver and frankly the more bones i break the more money i get i said oh well i like that bike you know and then i'm sitting there for a minute and i'm saying well wait a minute if this is this a dangerous shot huh yeah very dangerous well why is it so dangerous well you got to come out at 55 miles an hour on the dirt we got to make a, a sharp left turn. The back end of the Batmobile's got to slide around because of, it's going to slide because of the dust. And then we got to gun the engine, go over the the sign that's down on the ground, and then the sign's going to pop up as we head to Gotham City. You know, and whenever you're on dirt and you're going 55 miles an hour, it's hard to control things. I said, Oh, okay. And I'm sitting there. I said, Well, wait a minute. Do I have a stunt man? He said, Oh yeah, you got one. <laughs> oh well, that's good. well. Where is he? Oh, having lunch. Or he's having coffee with Adam. I said, wait a minute. So I hear them outside saying, all right, roll it up. Get ready to film. I said, wait, whoa, whoa, there's a terrible mistake here. (laughs) And the second unit director's name was Ruben, comes up and says, Bert, what's the matter? We're ready to go. I said, Ruben, this man tells me it's a stuntman. Yeah, we know that. Yeah, but he tells me this is a dangerous shot. Yes, we know that, Bert. But he tells me I have a stuntman that is having coffee with Adam. Why isn't he here instead of me? Oh, we can't use him. Oh, you, you can't use him? Well, well, why not? He doesn't look like you. <laughs> oh, well, wait a minute. Why would you hire a stuntman to be my stuntman if he doesn't look like me? Well, we couldn't find anybody else. Oh my you got to do it. And I, oh, well, all right, all right. I, you know, <laughs> now I'm adjust. So, and, and so, so the stuntman, Hubie says, hold on. And I said, okay. So I go to hold on. First thing I do is look for my seatbelt. There's no seatbelt. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Now, they say, hold on. All right, well, let me hold on. You know, on the inside of the door, you've got a door handle, right? No door handle. Oh. Not because that's where they needed for the lights and the, t- the equipment and the cables to go. So they removed the door handles. Okay. What am I going to hold on to? And I look in front of me. Here is this windshield that is probably one sixteenth of an inch of plastic. Right? I mean, it, wow. you, you could, you, you, a straw would be stronger than that plastic, okay? So here I'm going to hold on to this, and we come out at 65 miles an hour, right? And I kind of take my feet and I spread them against on the inside to, to against the door and against the center thing, trying to get some kind of traction. And he come right at the, at, he did it perfectly. He drove perfectly. But when he made that fast turn, okay, on my side, my door unexpectedly flew open, <gasps> and it knocked the cameraman. He was sitting on what they call a little camera right. truck. It's not an actual truck. It's like a little thing they sit on uh, where where they have the equipment on it and a big, you know, big BNC thirty five millimeter camera. Knocked the camera man over. Knocked the, the the camera truck over. An arc lamp fell down. If that arc lamp had landed on somebody, that would have been dead instantly because oh they're God. so big and heavy. And and I was thrown to the door, and you know how you, you know you don't even remember what you did. I, I remember throwing my hand, my left arm behind me, trying to catch onto something. And believe it or not, my little finger wrapped around the gear shift. Okay, and it kept me from fully falling out, but it pulled my finger out of joint. Mm. You know, just pulled it out of. It's incredibly painful. Yeah, I can hear and that so, in my oh, head. So now, now that you have a crash, you know, people are are, are knocked over dust everywhere you can't even see anything there's so much dust because it's all on dirt right and they some they, all of a sudden i've got a couple of crew members saying bird are you okay and i said yes but my hand is killing me and even though i'm wearing a glove okay you can see from that glove that my little finger on my left hand is now swollen up twice the size and is stretching the gloves mm. you, you understand yeah all right yes. because my finger was out of joint they said oh bird your finger's out of joint we got to get you to the hospital right away i said okay and they helped me out of the car and you know, 
you're shaking up, you know. And and I said, okay, well, where's the car to take me to the hospital? Oh, we can't go now, Bert. <laughs> what, what do you mean? We didn't get the shot. Oh, but my, my finger. I don't. I have to go to the hospital. Yes, but we can't go now. It costs us thirty thousand dollars every fifteen minutes to shoot this show. Jeez. You've got to stay here until we get the shot. This is at seven thirty in the morning. Oh my and god! At, at noon, I left for the hospital. At noon, after doing the shot three more times, till they got it. You should have called up George Barris and said, "George, ever heard of seatbelts?" <laughs> uh, let me let me tell you something. George Barris wasn't my biggest fan, and I'll tell you why. I, mean, I, I got along with him very well, but he, let me tell you why uh, why he wasn't a biggest fan. Because in the very first episode, the same episode, by the way, we had a scene that we pull up to outside of what we, is supposedly a museum. Okay, and 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 the way the Batmobile pulls up, it's it's, it's kind of the back end of the Batmobile is facing where the museum is. So Adam and I are supposed to jump out of the car. You know, I mean, well, well, actually, I used to really jump out of the car. But, in, you know, open the door and come out. And they had it set up on my side to film Adam and I coming, you know, getting out of our out of the car, right? Mm-hmm. And it, so that we could both be seen. Well, I did what I thought was right because I was going behind me, right? In other words, I, I, why get out of the car, open the door, get out, and run to the back? I stood up in the seat, stood up on the door, and on his three hundred thousand dollar paint job and car, I walked on that delicate fiberglass fin to the <laughs> end and jumped off the back. That's why uh. he, they had to restrain him and his two assistants. They were going to kill me <laughs> because I was messing up his paint job. Well, but oh. the director, ro- listen to this: the director Robert Butler, okay, said, "Cut, cut, Bert. You were supposed to come out the door. You didn't tell us you're going to get up and going on the back." He said, "Okay, I'm sorry." And he stopped for a minute. He says, "You know," he says, "That's real what you did." Yeah. He said, "We're going to take thirty minutes. Go get some tracks. Lay down the plywood." And they got you know did a, a dolly shot. Do you understand? Right. Where they and you can see that on the first episode where I climb up, walk to the back, and jump off. And because it, I, you have to understand, the one of the reasons they liked what Adam and I did so much is that we made it real. Right. We, you know, I mean, you know that you're filming, but at the same time, you let go. And what would you do? And I did what I would do, you know? And and it was those kinds of things. And, and years later, after I got my star on Hollywood Boulevard, it's customary for the celebrity to throw a little after, you know, event party, which, the, you know, mine was right on Hollywood Boulevard, right in front of the Guinness Museum of World Records couldn't find a better place in Hollywood Boulevard right across from Adam's star where technically the two stars were facing each other wow. and and around the corner is the Hollywood Museum so I, I rented the Hollywood Museum, a big, beautiful incredible museum, and I threw a giant party there for everybody that was Batman related, and one of the guests that came as a surprise guest okay, was Robert Butler the director oh. of that pilot episode. Wow. I hadn't seen him in 55 years. Jeez. And he said to me, here's a piece of trivia for your, your listeners. He said, Bert, I have a story to tell you that you don't know about. And I said, yes. You know, I got all ears. He said, when I came, when I was hired and I came on the set, William Dozier, executive producer, said, we've got this young kid on here playing Robin. And I just want to make sure that you think he's going to be able to do a good job and that you're going to be able to work with him. So I want you to go over and I want you to talk to him for a few minutes and then come back and tell me what you think. Okay? I remember, I don't remember what was all the things were said, but I remember the director coming over and saying, can I talk to you for a few minutes? And here, this is like a real director. I mean, a, a well-known, respected And he's asking me to talk. Well, of course. But, you know what I mean? I was so honored. I didn't know this. This is this Robert Butler telling me this, and he said that when he went back after talking to me, and he, and, and he went and talked to the executive producer. He said, "The executive producer, said, what do you think?" He says, "This guy is so good. I'm not going to tell him anything because everything he comes out with is better than I could direct." <laughs> I mean, what a compliment! Yeah, what a compliment! You and, you were so uh, real that it's a good thing you didn't demand that they use a real shark in a Batman movie because. Well, no, but remember, it's biting at, 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 at Batman's leg, not that's mine. That's right. Oh, that's right. That, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You see, he, I was, I was flying the Batcopter, and 
and I lowered the bat copter, and he was on with that rope ladder, and when he went into the water, I lowered it too, too far, you know, because we thought he was landing on a boat when it was just an image projected. It wasn't a real boat there, okay? And so he went into the water, and that's when the shark came up on his leg, and he's beating it with his hand, you know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> that was a great scene. It was way before Sharknado, and it was way better than Sharknado. Yeah, well, and then I had to go. I had to go out of the helicopter, go down the ladder, and hang upside down, and hand him the anti shark off bat spray right. <laughs> that now, he sprayed onto the shark, and the shark let go of his leg. A, a question for you uh, from our audience: They they tended to do this a little bit more back in the '60s, and I, I wanted to ask your opinion of it. Because you guys had a couple, actually at least three characters that I can think of on Batman that were played by multiple actors. The Riddler was played by Frank Gorshin and John Astin. Uh, Mr. Right. Freeze was George Sanders, Otto Preminger, and Eli Wallach. And then, of course, you know, Catwoman was played by the three lovely ladies as well. Was there right. any feedback that you got, whether it was from the studios or whether it was from audiences? that were confused by the fact that there was different actors. The, the reason I ask is we interviewed Bill Asher, who directed uh, many, many, many episodes of Bewitched. He created it because he was married with, to Elizabeth Montgomery. And he told us that when they switched the Darrens, nobody even really noticed. So I was wondering if you ever heard oh, any feedback that on Batman. that. They noticed, they noticed, but they also knew that because of the publicity, and there, let me tell you something, it's so funny. When something works, Everybody who's in, in the business wants to be a part of it. You know, when Batman came out, it was the number one and number two show in the entire world. Every star, I don't care how big they were at the time, they wanted to be on Batman. I mean, Frank Sinatra was outraged that he couldn't play the Joker, which <laughs> Caesar had already been cast. Right. And, and the pressure from the families, especially if they had kids, for these actors to be on our show was immense, immense pressure. And, and so they would, you know, you've only gotten one villain a week, you know, although the last year they had a, like a double villain, you know, they would, because so much demand for, for, to be on the show. And, and, uh, and then, of course, there's the whole business about walking up the side of the building and the window would open, right, you know. Right. That's how they were able to get more of these stars who were just literally calling in favors, saying, wait a minute, I've worked for you, blah, 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 come on now, give me a, you know. So they created this, and it turned out, worked wonderfully climb adam and batman and robin climbing inside the bill and all of a sudden the window opens and the first person the first guest celebrity was none other than sammy davis jr yes. awesome. i mean what an amazing you know he was on our show and then there was later on jerry lewis and lurch and then colonel clink and then betty white and and uh, don ho and dick clark and you know it went on and on and on uh, every week was somebody that you know people had seen on television and were noteworthy and uh, and and still there was a demand that couldn't be fulfilled completely because yeah. too many people wanted to be on the show. I was well, amazed that Adam West did a movie with the Three Stooges. Did he ever talk to you about that? Well, he told me he had done a few movies that he was terribly proud of. Uh, okay, but. but but that wasn't one that he... I don't know about that one. I mean, I know that he did it. He never said anything about that particular movie. <clears throat> but there's other ones that, that he did that, you know... Cause it, look, when you're a young, and he was before Batman, a very young actor, you know, trying to get work. I mean, you you take what you can get. Yeah. And, you know, it's so hard and so competitive. And, you know, he was Captain Quick on the on the uh, commercial. Mm -hmm. You know, Nestle's, you know, Quick. Yeah. Uh, the the the, pow the chocolate you know powder that you put in a drink to make like a milkshake, and he was Captain Quick, and he was hired. He was noticed because of that, and they thought of him with Captain Quick and Batman, and that was where William Dozier saw him and and called him in for an interview. Wow. Right. Now I before we move on, uh, we definitely want to talk about uh, something that we're very excited with your product line, but before we move on, I just wanted to ask you, Bert, I, I mean, so much of your life uh, is Batman, and, and, you know, it's followed you through, you've done voice work as Robin, you've done, you've been on shows like Futurama, and it's all because of the Batman connection. If you had to pick one film or a project that you did that was not Batman-related, 
Which one would you be most proud of? Well, let me say this. I, I, I want to sort of answer your question in a different way. Okay. I was fortunate enough to, I starred in 40 films for television. Mm -hmm. These are smaller TV movies. So, and the way I looked at it, let, let me tell you how I look at it. Think of a glass of water that the glass is full of water, mm -hmm. okay? It could be full from doing a whole bunch of different projects, or it could be full from one major product project and a few smaller projects. Right. You see what I'm saying? Right. It's still full, okay? And that's the way I looked at it. But I will tell you about one film that I didn't get that is uh, that that work more comes to mind than than the ones that I did do. And when I was doing Batman, here it was number one show and number two in the entire world. And there was a young producer at 20th Century Fox. The name was Larry Terman. And he came to me and said, Bert, you know, uh, I've got a very small project here, uh, okay, at Fox. And, you know, I'd love for you to star in it. And, and uh, he says, I've already talked to the producers. This is during your hiatus, the time off. So there's no conflict, okay? And I would love you to star in this role. And I said, oh, gee, wow, that's a great thing. It's fantastic. It's wonderful. And, and he said that, he said, you know, and I said, well, geez, um, I guess it's a good thing that it's being done here at Fox. He said, yes, because, you know, it's not like another studio where mm -hmm. they'd have some competitive thing and Fox would demand that you could, you know, do it right, because right. of a, a competing studio. So I'm all set to do this. And ABC, who at the time was a syndicated network, people don't realize there was only two broadcast networks in the United States, CBS and NBC. ABC was a syndicated network. It didn't have, and it didn't have as many stations. It didn't have the pull. It didn't have the ratings. But what made it the third television network was two shows: Bewitched and Batman. Yeah. Right. The success of those two shows made the syndicated network the number three network. Why I'm saying this is that ABC objected. They didn't want me doing anything else. They didn't want me to dilute. My character is Robin. Is that whole so typecast? Yes, movie. Uh, what? Is that whole yeah, typecast? Well, it's not that the typecasting. They just didn't want that me pe people to see me as other than Robin at the yeah. time. Right. Because here it is, still number one in the entire world. Number one and number two. We're on twice a week. So, by the way, do you know what the name of the movie was? No. It was called The Graduate. You oh, might have heard of it. They couldn't get me. They got a guy named Dustin Hoffman. Yeah. You might have heard of him. You'd have been perfect. Oh, wow. I can see you as that, definitely. And 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 every four or five years, I would run into this producer, Larry Terman, at some restaurant in L.A. or something. He'd say, you know, Bert, I always wanted you for that role. I said, don't tell me anymore, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, well I, I want you to know that, that we here at Cult Radio love the little films, the films a lot of actors don't like to talk about. That includes right. Adam with his happy hooker goes to Hollywood, <laughs> and you right. with your Virgin High. Okay, those movies. Oh yeah, there, I was on that. That's one of the smaller ones I did. And uh, the director and writer producer uh, uh, Richard Gabai is a dear friend of mine. Yeah, he. Uh, in fact, uh, we he, we he was at my uh, when I got my star in Hollywood Boulevard. Been personal friends for years, and I talked to him a few months ago. Just and just the nicest guy. Oh yeah, it. He did some great stuff, and he had a, a wonderful deal. Oh, he made a whole bunch of movies, mm -hmm. and he wrote them. He starred in some of them. He uh, and he he just made a great. He has had a natural and a knack for for making great product. Well, I have to tell you, Bert. The last time we talked to you about four years ago, uh, you told all of our listeners all about Gentle Giants Dog and Puppy Food. And we had told right. you at the end of the interview that we really hoped, and you said you were working on it, we really hoped that someday you would have food available and marketed for cats because we are a three-cat household. We love our, our fur babies. They are our children. And I am so happy to find out that now there is Gentle Giants cat and kitten food. I am literally going to call you after this interview. I'm putting in an order. My cats are switching over to your food. They're going to they're gonna become Gentle Giant cats. And I want you to tell all of our listeners about the cat food that's out. And, and what makes it special? I understand you, you have a whole scientific basis and understanding of why this food is better. It actually extends cats' lives, right? Didn't, didn't your cat start out eating your dog food? Food and now you got official cat food. Yes, yes. Let me, let me explain something. First of all, this 
the, the whole thing with food for animals is the charity that my wife and I have. We don't take any salary from this. This is all about loving animals and doing everything we can to help them live longer and healthier. For the last 30 years, my wife and I have operated Gentle Giants Rescue, which is the world's largest giant breed dog rescue. When you think of giant breeds, you're talking like uh, Great Danes, Irish Wolfhounds, St. Bernards, English Mastiffs. I mean, there's like, you know, a, a, probably 60 or 70 giant breeds. And we've had all of them here, okay? Mm-hmm. And we even have some smaller breeds. We even have tiny breeds called Chinese Cresteds that are one-third the size of a Chihuahua. Mm-hmm. A Chihuahua weighs five and a half to six pounds. We have dogs here that, as adults, weigh two pounds. So we go from two pounds up to 300 pounds. <laughs> but all animals live very short lives in comparison to humans. Yeah. And they love you unconditionally. Okay, no matter you've had the best day at work or the worst, it doesn't matter. They love you. So when my wife and I were saving these dogs, and we noticed that the, the, the giant breeds live such short lifespans. I mean, Irish wolfhounds and mastiffs, they live six to eight years. That's all they live. Great Danes, seven to nine years. And when we would lose one, my wife and I would sob. Yeah. And we vowed if there was a way, if there was a way, we would find a way to help them live longer and healthier. And we first developed a feeding and care program, which <clears throat> any of your listeners, if they have a dog, they could go to GeneralGiantsDogFood.com. Uh, if they have a cat, go to GeneralGiantsCatFood.com. And they can read about our special feeding and care program that will add three to five years to your pet's life just by the way you feed them. We mm. don't feed like regular people do twice a day. We feed five times a day, smaller, more frequent meals. Mm. Why do we do that? Because their bodies wear out much faster than humans, and the greatest stress on an animal's body is digestion. Yeah. We elevate the food in water dishes so that why? Because people, you see these commercials and dogs lean way down to get the food, then they come out and then down to get the water up and down and up and down every day they prematurely wear their bodies out so this is part of our program but our food is different from every food in the world and let me tell you how it differs two big things number one pet food companies know something the average person doesn't know which is the more fat content they put in the food the hungrier it makes the animal Mm. it by adding massive amounts of fat into the food dogs will keep eating and eating cats too but more significantly with dogs and even if you put a lot of food out there they eat so much they throw up and keep eating because their body is craving food because of the fat content okay and and i tell people you want to know the difference with your dog between gentle giants and and your food go pick up three or four kibbles rub those kibbles in your fingers real good put them down rub your fingers together you're going to feel that slightly greasy feeling oh yeah yeah we always feel yeah we feed that feel that i said you know what that is no not really animal fat yeah. so, oh okay was well, that a big deal well let me ask you if you cook some bacon would you take a can of bacon grease pour it down your garbage disposal oh of course not i would never do that why oh well because it would clog it up and and it would harden and i'd have to buy a new garbage disposal exactly so when you realize that animal fat will ruin a metal garbage disposal, what do you think is happening to the arteries and intestines of your dog? Right. When every single day, I don't care if it's the cheapest grocery store food or the most expensive pet store food. Every one I've ever seen, every single one, puts coating of animal fat, a greasy coating on the outside of the food, all about money, yeah. money, money, money. We don't do that. So when you feel gentle giants, oh, gee, this is bone dry. In fact, if you rubbed our kibbles together of our cat food or dog food, you rubbed them hard enough, you can make a powder. So that's number one. And what is the difference? Dogs' arteries aren't clogged with fat, reducing the flow of nutrients throughout the body. Changes the lifespan of the dog. It's not that we discovered the fountain of youth. We haven't. We're just not prematurely killing dogs or cats. Right. And in the case, so that's number one. But let me tell you number two, which is really big, and people are just starting to learn about it. Do you know that the human and animal food supply in the United States is more than 90% genetically modified? Let, let me, if you don't know about it, let me explain. For those that, that do know about it, I'll reinforce what they know. When farmers grow plants, like let's say rice, or fruits or vegetables, whatever, they grow a plant 
pests will attack that plant. If they spray that rice plant with a pesticide, half the time it kills the plant. So the farmer doesn't produce the crop. In 1996, Roundup Ready crops was introduced. This is the same Roundup that you hear about people getting cancer yeah. from using it to kill weeds. Yeah. Same one. And in that is a deadly carcinogen called glyphosate. And that glyphosate was mixed into the DNA of the, of the food we eat for one purpose. When a farmer grows rice, use that same example, and, that, and, and the pests attack it, he can spray Roundup, the weed killer, on that plant. It'll kill the pest, but it won't kill the plant. Yeah. And he'll produce all of that rice and, and sell it, make a ton of money. But the problem is the plant and the rice has absorbed the pesticide. Yeah. And now, we, uh, we, on our website, we have a video. We, we actually didn't even make it. We took it from a research site. And all these veterinarians in this eight-minute video say the same thing, which is 15, 20, 25 years ago, we would see one patient at our clinic a month that had cancer, whether it's a dog or a cat. Now, every single day, one out of every two dogs and cats they see every single day already has cancer. And they blame that on the genetically modified organisms in the food. Mm -hmm. And since almost 98% of our food supply in the United States is already GMO, that, that's why all these dogs are getting cancer and dying. Yeah. And so what did we do? We spent a year and a half to find all non-GMO ingredients. We buy from the 2%. Not the 98%, the 2% that we can find that every single ingredient in our food is non-GMO. Well, it's and so what does that mean? That means longer life. That means, we, you know, we, have, we thought we had the longest dog living. One of our dogs, a giant breed that normally lives only seven to nine years, she lived to 27 and a half. Wow. Four yeah. times her life. Wow. I just finished filming a commercial in Phoenix, Arizona, where the man in Phoenix has got a 29-year-old dog that's been eating our food for 15 years. Wow. 29 years old. We lost two cats two years ago. <clears throat> One was 31 years old. The other was 32 years old. Wow. <laughs> and this is because we don't use genetically modified organisms in our food. And, and I only, I'm only aware of one or two other foods that have non-GMOs, but they have a qualifier on their bag that says this food was made in a plant where there could be some cross-contamination mm -hmm. with GMO, which is like saying, oh, there might be just a little bit of cancer in this right. bag. Well, and what people don't realize is it is so important because, you know, everybody focuses on trying to take care of their animals. I take my animal to the vet. People don't really focus on what they put into their animals' bodies. And the, the more the bigger the animal or also the more distinct the breed or pure the breed is the less their lifespan is like we personally we have two sphinx cats and they have a lifespan of like seven years so if you can improve their life and extend their life by by what you feed them and a lot of, i know a lot of uh animal people say oh well you know i do an all raw diet but you can give an animal too much protein of course and too much fat. And you know what the problem with the all raw, raw diet is? <laughs> it's still GMO. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I believe that know, about the GMO it, thing. I it, didn't even it know. It doesn't have anything to do with whether it's raw or not. Right. If you don't have, if you don't have ingredients that are certified non-GMO, you're, you're, you're looking for a cruising for a bruising, the way I describe it, because you, you just can't, you, you can't, give carcinogens in animal food and expect them to live long. A lot of people and don't even don't realize do that. That, that a lot of people don't even realize that animals can get cancer like that. But they oh, can. Oh, absolutely. That, that's the number the American Veterinary um, uh, uh, Association, which is the licensing of, of veterinarians in the United States, has stated that cancer is the number one killer of dogs and cats in America yeah. by far. Yeah. In fact, they, they, there's statements and there's uh, indications that more than 90% of the dogs and cats in the U.S. die of cancer, more than 90%. Well, let me say this. We, we decided that we are going to use only your food because we love our cats that much, and that's how you prove you love them because you want them with you. And I want people to know, oh, you may think, oh, Bert's a celebrity and he's got his, his 
face on the package and you got this really cool package it looks like a comic book strip and everything it's going to be more expensive no it's not we checked it out your food was cheaper than what we pay for other food yes because we don't take anything from it we basically sell it for our cost so many people say oh i know you might not take a salary but you take all the profits mm-hmm. you put in your rest i said no no you don't understand that we basically sell it for just about what it costs us plus what we have to keep it you know re- reserve in case of damages and you know non-deliveries and stuff like that no this is all this is our charity and we love animals but i'll tell you our food is now available all across the u.s it's online on Chewy.com, Petco.com, PetSmart.com, TractorSupply.com, Target.com. And, and, and one other thing I was going to say, we're also in quite a few stores. Now, um, we are in uh, about half of the Target stores in the United States. In Texas, we're in HEB in California. We're in uh, Stater Brothers and Ralph's and Gelson's. Uh, and back east, we're in the Food City. So we're, we're getting that distribution, but people can easily get our food online. And the most important thing is you can have a chance to have your dog live an extra, or cat, an extra five or ten years longer. And, and the, and, but it's not just the length of the life, it's the quality of the life. You know, so many people, with their, they, their animal gets sick and they go to the vet. Do you know how expensive vet bills have become? Oh, yeah, yeah. They're, they're almost like human bills. Well, let me tell you something you might find interesting, your listeners, that here at our rescue, our animals are so healthy when they eat gentle giants. The only time they go to a veterinarian is every three years for a rabies vaccination. Wow. We don't have illness here. Zero illness. None. And and I'll tell you, all you need is one good vet bill. Yeah. <laughs> Anything you think you save, you have it. And then your animal is suffering. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard. You know, you have to take off work. And uh, it's all. it doesn't have to be that way. If you feed them the right food and you don't put ingredients in there that are going to cause them to get cancer, they can live so much longer and healthier and happier. Right. Well, and also important, uh, I understand that with your food, which is especially important if you have breeds that are athletic uh, or older, is that you have certain uh, ancient grains and superfoods in in your dog and cat food, which is good for joints. Exactly. Exactly. Let me let me give you a quick something that you might find interesting. Glucosamine and chondroitin are very well known. They're they're used for humans for joints, you know, for to support your joints and your cartilage and stuff between the joints. It's a very positive thing. We have in our food New Zealand green mussel. You think of it this way: if you have something in a powdered form, it's not near as potent as if you have something in a living form on planet Earth. There is one planet, and one place on planet Earth that has an enormous amount of this glucosin and, and chondroitin for joints, and it is New Zealand green mussels. Mm-hmm. They can be as expensive as $100 a pound, and they're in every bag of our cat food, every bag of our dog food, and every can of our cat, cat food, and every can of our dog. Everything we make has New Zealand green mussels in it because of the enormous con- content of glucosamine and chondroitin for joints. You know, again, everything we do is targeted. What can we do to keep these animals living longer and healthier? And one quick thing I want to tell you, since you have cats, mm-hmm. I, we just filmed another a, a spot, a commercial spot that's going to air with a prominent veterinarian, an expert, 25 years of vet, plus a research scientist, really brilliant man. And, you know, one of the things that people tell us for cats, they have no fur balls when they feed our food. I mean, it's not like less. I mean, like zero wow. fur balls. And, and I... I asked this vet during the interview, I said, well, can you tell me, we're still trying to figure out, why don't we, uh, why do cats eating gentle giant cat and kitten food don't have, why don't they have fur balls? He said, well, they could have fur balls, but they likely don't. And I said, well, why? He says, because cats, the fur balls are caused by the cats excessively licking themselves mm. and the uh, cleaning themselves. Right. And they, what prompts them to do this is the fat content in the food. Oh. Wow. When you have a higher fat content, it causes the cats to lick themselves more. And in cleaning that, they're accumulating that fur ball that they end up vomiting out. He says, because you have that lower fat content, they, they're, they're not having, they clean themselves, but they're not doing excessive cleaning and they're not creating fur balls. Wow. Wow. Well, 
I had a special message for you, and uh, <clears throat> you can kind of parlay it into letting us know what the status is of Gentle Giants Rescue right now, but the message I have from you is from a friend of ours who was also a guest on the show, what? Mitzi Capture. She said, yeah, actress Mitzi Capture, she said, please tell Bert what? and Tracy I said hello because we got two of our dogs from their rescue. Right. Right. Yes. Yes. Very Mitzi. Oh, what a sweet lady. Oh my goodness. You know, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. They. They. It, it, yeah. It, well, we have. I mean, uh, uh, with on the Ellen show, uh, several of the her crew got uh, dogs, and because we've adopted fifteen thousand five hundred. <laughs> wow. And by the way, those fifteen thousand five hundred, every single one of them lived in our house. Oh my god. You know, we have fifty in our house, fifty dogs at all times. Fifty. I'm not talking 15. I'm saying five zero fifty. <laughs> and we've had 50 in our house for 30 years. That's and as lot. we adopt them, we take new ones in. Right. We feed 600 pounds of our food here every single day. 600 pounds. That's, that's 20, 30-pound bags of Gentle Giants every single day. And, and, and every one of these animals lives in our house. And I'm in a, I, I'm, right now, I am eight feet away from a 26 year old dog. 26 oh. year old, her name is Tinkerbell. She's going to go on 27. <laughs> and, okay, and people would give anything if they could have their animals live longer yeah. and healthier, no illness. Yeah. Well, you got Mitzi okay. from uh, Silk Stockings. Do you have other celebrity clientele? I mean, you get a lot of celebrity actors and stuff. You get, uh... Oh, yes, we ab- absolutely. Yeah, we, we've had. Lot, lots of celebrities that have gotten their dogs from us. Uh, uh, Vanessa Williams got her Great Dane from us. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and a lot, a lot of people have, uh, have gotten their dogs from us because, you know, this is where they all came. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, we, we always had, like, like they said, about 50 dogs in our house and probably those at least 15 or 20 are Great Danes. We all together, out of 15,500 that have lived in our home in the last 30 years, we're right at about eight thousand two hundred that were Great Danes. Wow! Now, are you guys eight thousand? <laughs> are you guys still adopting out, or because the last time we talked, you said that because the dogs were kind of older, they're they're getting older, living longer, right. happier We've lives. Actually, right. We're not adopting right now because our dogs are living so long. I mean, I've got I've got dogs here that I think at least five or six are over twenty years of age. Wow! And we can only have so many. We don't ever go over our limit. And, but so we can't really, if you know what I mean, I can't, yeah. I can't adopt. I mean, people don't want to adopt a dog that is 15 to 20 years old, right? right. I mean, they want, to, they, they want to adopt a dog that's a couple years old or maybe up to three or four, but not 15 to 20. So, and we're not going to do anything because these dogs, they, they're li- going to live out their life here. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I have people calling me and say, well, wait a minute. If I start eating Gentle Giants, can I live longer? <laughs> <laughs> well, I said, now look, I said, we're... We're talking about animals and pets. We're not talking about humans, but but nevertheless, all our ingredients are. And by the way, we have our canned food. Everything we've done something. I don't know if anybody else does. Everything that goes in our canned food is fresh. It put in the can fresh and cooked in the can. Cooked wow. in the can. Wow. So when you get it, this is absolutely everything you will talk about: fresh meat, fr- fresh beef, fresh chicken, fresh salmon, and our the plant that we get, have it made. Is like right near the ocean. So when these ships come in from from fishing all night long, and okay, we're getting fish sometimes that you know less than five or six hours that, that it was caught. Wow! How fresh that is. I know what's important inside the package, but I, I want to say again, I love your packaging. How did that come about with the comic book uh, style? <laughs> That's my wife Tracy. Her philosophy is this, and some people like it, and some people. You know, they say, oh, that's too much to read. And we say, well, look, if it's too much to read, don't read it. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> but the people that want to know, see, my, my wife, when she when she was growing up as a child, and she always wanted to do the best for her dogs and her cats, she she would say, I look at a, a bag, and every bag is the same. It's got a picture, an airbrush picture half the time of a dog or a cat. It, it says veterinarian recommended. And that's, you know, it's either, you know, growth or maintenance or whatever. You, you don't know anything about it. Well, she believes just the opposite. We want people to know everything we can tell them. So when we say veterinarian recommended, we don't just say that. We have a photo of the vet or his business. We have a quote, his own quote about our food. You, you see what I'm saying? Right. And, 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 we, and you, we have the actual dogs that are eating the food on there. Everything is real. 
and and she believes that the more you can show people and tell people and they see how you do it we explain how how we keep these dogs living so long you know it's not magic it's science well, I even love your website because on there is a dachshund wearing a Robin costume. <laughs> he dressed oh, yeah. like Robin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know they they dress them up in Batman and Robin clothes, and so it's really cute. It, you know, it, and you know, we we love animals. And, and to be honest with you, you know, I'll tell you what we are looking to do in the future. Mm-hmm. My wife and I, because we everything is going very well with our food, it continues to grow and grow and grow. But we are now going to be making some television shows and movies. Fantastic. And we have got our own animation studio in a separate building on our property. Beautiful new animation studio with a recording studio. And now we're, uh, we're taking one of our other buildings and making it to a sound stage where we can do our own filming. We're going to produce programming that is uplifting. Because I, if, in a nutshell, what my wife Tracy and I want to do, we actually want to leave this planet better than we found it. Yeah. And all we do in our life now is charity. Every single thing we do is to help out and to help people and to try to make a better world for all of us. I think Animal Planet should give you guys a call. I really do. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah, they, they, uh, we, we, uh, we at one time were thinking of doing our own um, reality show with all these dogs in the house. And at the time, a funny thing happened. I just got to share this. Is uh, it's kind of crazy? Sure. But we had where we live. They have animals here are 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 more allowed than in other cities. In other, this is a animal friendly community, and people have emus and horses and cows and pigs, and and they have uh, they have like uh, even camels. And we had a neighbor that was going away for the weekend and asked us if we could watch her camel. Okay. <laughs> now, no, I mean, you know how big a camel is? Yeah. Let me tell you something. They're a lot bigger than a horse. Okay, they're huge. And we got this camel, and to make a long story short, we didn't have the facility outside. We were under construction. We had to watch this camel for the weekend, and we brought this camel in our house. Oh my! Oh my God! Oh, I'm not surprised. This is the real thing. This is the real thing. And just to give you an idea, and we have big, tall, double doors in the front, right? This camel had to lean down and even lint his body down to get into under our door so we got in the room. <laughs> I, right? I, I read and, that you always wanted a giraffe. Yes, I did. My wife won't let me have it. I just thought it would be <laughs> cool. As you, as you drive up towards our property and behind the house, you see this giraffe walking. You know, I always wanted that, but I, she won't let me have it because actually it's too dangerous. It is, yeah. and and that that is a wild animal, and a wild animal is not considered domesticated enough right. to live in our city. But in any event, you, you know, I just got to tell you one thing about this camel because this is something that I guarantee you people have never seen. There is a command, an Arabic command, to, to give the ca- camel, it, and it's it's kush kush. Mm-hmm. That's uh-huh. what you say, and that camel can fold up like an erector set, okay? What? And they fold their legs under, and they, they sit down on their belly, and when even with this camel, his belly is on the ground. His hump is taller than me. <laughs> his hump is taller than me, and of course his head sticks up, and thank goodness we have like 14, 18 foot ceilings in our house, so it's okay that you know he's not gonna hit anything. But, but the point of it is, they are so gigantic. <clears throat> And everybody says, well, what, what about the dogs? What about the, what did they do? Did they bark? No, they didn't bark. They were a little bit, you know, cautious at first. But this camel had been raised with dogs. Wow. And he loved dogs. <laughs> and there was a point, and I wish I had a camera to take that picture. One of our big gray Danes, who looked tiny compared to him, came up and they nosed each other. And it was so sweet. Aww. There was no, you know, and it was like, and he was just so comfortable. And he, I, I know that you're your listeners are going to think I'm completely nuts, but this was a housebroken camel. Yeah. <laughs> this camel, we would take him out every so often. He'd do his little pellets. They have these little pellets. They'd just drop these pellets outside, you know, and he'd drink, and of course, they, they, they love to eat, and their feet, have you ever seen a close-up of what a camel's foot looks no. like? Their, their, their hooves, they, it looks like a big balloon. In other words, they, they, because of being in the desert, they, they, instead of having a, like a hoof, like a horse does, their foot foot is flat at the bottom, and it's and it's kind of like jiggles, so it works perfectly on sand. 
And and at any event, this it, it, we had him for the weekend. He he was amazing. And I know you're going to really think that I'm crazy, but I'm going to tell you one last thing. His name was Bert. <laughs> not because of me. His name was Bert, and you can actually look it up. Bert was the only official um, uh, 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 law enforcement camel in the world. With his, it's, The city is called San Dimas, S-A-N-D-I-M-A-S. They right. can look it up. Bert, B-E-R-T. They spelled it. Mine's B-U-R-T. He's B-E-R-T. And, and the only uh, law enforcement camel in the world. And, and he was with the San Dimas Sheriff's Office. And, uh, and look it up in Guinness Book of Records. And uh, anyway, just the sweetest thing in the whole world. But a head that I'm telling you, uh, it's got to be at least four feet long. Wow. I mean, you just can't believe anything could be that big. And just just mild. And he loved horses because, you know, in our community, everything is horses and stuff like that. And it was just... It was one of those events, and we got great pictures of him, and you know, and, and video of him, you know, in, in our house. <laughs> oh, I want to see this! I hope That's you get to great. do all this production. Sounds great. I got to believe that you named some of your dogs after Batman villains. <laughs> oh, I, I, that you don't <laughs> well, need a penguin. Named and... them. Oh my gosh! Yeah, my, my wife Tracy, she names them, and she we've had oh well, we have all the regular names, and then we have some unusual names, and then because she wants to be authentic. When we'll get a, we'll get like, for example, there is a breed of dog called uh, a Siberian Ofcharka that comes from Siberia, and of course she had to pick a Siberian name that I can't pronounce. <laughs> I mean, you know, my wife Tracy's like she has to be so authentic with everything. You know what I mean? Right. So official. <laughs> well, happy Mother's Day to her, and happy Father's Day to you coming up. Thank you. Because I know you got Thank great you. family. You are are so blessed to have the wife that you have because you are so. Perfect. Oh my gosh. Well, you know what they say: opposites attract. Yeah. But 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 you know but but seriously, can I tell you? I I tell everybody, and you know I'm a little bit talkative, right? But I tell everybody that it's a good thing that they talk to me first before speaking to my wife, because if they talk to Tracy first, they would think I was a mute. I <laughs> she could talk out talk me ten to one. Wow. Well, we love you, Bert. We love Tracy. We love everything you're doing for the animals. And we encourage our listeners to check out both of their websites, uh, GentleGiantsDogFood.com and GentleGiantsCatFood.com. We are. We're, we we're are. your customer from now on until the end of time. We are buying only your food. And we well, will. We want, I want your animals to live as long as ours. And, you know, here I was thinking that we had the oldest dog in the world at 27 and a half. And then we got a call from man. He says, I just want you to know that I've been feeding you my food, your food for 15 years to my dog, and she's 29 years old. Wow. And he showed me the medical certificate that he got her when she was six weeks old from the pound. Wow. 29 years old. I go, oh, my gosh. Just when you can't believe anything could be that amazing, somebody comes up with something more amazing. Yes, that is amazing. Well, now, you, you got to know what you're doing, Bert. You sound like you're 20 years old. I swear to God, you sound the same. <laughs> well, you, you, you know what I tell everybody? The first hundred years are the hardest. Yeah. That is yeah. <laughs> well, as we as we wrap this up, we're actually going to, when we uh, disconnect this call here, we're actually going to play a couple of tracks of Bert singing, uh, some, some tracks that he recorded with Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention. <laughs> and I know, Bert, that you also, I believe in, in college, did a stint as a DJ, so we're gonna yes. we're, we're gonna play "Boy Wonder I Love You." We were wondering if you could end this interview by announcing "Boy Wonder I Love You," and then we'll go to the track right afterwards. Okay, all right. You tell me when you're ready. Okay, we're ready. Hi everyone, this is Bert Ward. I played Robin the Boy Wonder in the Batman TV series, and I took a series of fan letters and worked with an amazing musician. Frank Zappa to create this next song. It's called Boy Wonder, I Love You. Amazing. Perfect. Thank you, Bert. Thank you so much, Bert. Have a great rest of your night. And everybody uh, check uh, out GentleGiantsDogFood.com and GentleGiantsCatFood.com. All right. Thank you so much. Thank and we you. said on Batman to the Batmobile. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>